So hello everybody and welcome to this uh, webinar that will start now. Uh, the webinar is recorded. Uh, it's uh, the Climate and Clean Air Coalition who is organizing with every woman, every child, uh, a, a webinar about mitigating air pollution from household energy to improve women and children's health. I'm ex very excited to be here with you. There are so many webinars going on uh, and, and a few of them are those that capture attention. This one is definitely one to be pragmatic on what could be done. So I'm I'm from the Climate and Clean Air Coalition and it's the Household Energy Initiative that is behind this webinar. Uh, household Energy is one of the sectors that we in the CCAC are working on with concrete activities to reduce emissions from short-lived climate pollutants, which is our mission. And that includes uh, black carbon from incomplete combustion, methane, ozone and HFCs. Uh, I wanted to make a few points before passing over the floor to our moderator and excellent speakers here. And the first point is that household air pollution disproportionately impacts women's and children's health. That, that's what's bringing us together today. So almost 3 billion uh, people still cook and heat themselves using solid fuels like wood, crap waste, charcoal, coal and dung in open fires and inefficient stoves. And Household air pollution is the single leading environmental health risk and main cause of non-communicable disease. I'm sure we hear more about this from our colleague Heather from WHO. In poorly ventilated houses, indoor smoke can be up to 100 times higher than acceptable levels for fine particles, which really means a huge exposure, especially to women and young children. And it's also doubling the risk for childhood pneumonia. My third point is about anthropogenic black carbon emissions, which is our mission in the CCAC. So more than 50% of anthropogenic black carbon uh, comes from cooking, heating and kerosene lamps from indoor pollution. And for those that don't know, black carbon is the ultra part of the ultrafine particles impacting health and contributing to near term climate change. So really cleaning up the household energy sources and improving stoves. Uh, and technology, the access to both the energy and the stoves, and, and, and in addition to re reliability of this uh, solution, will have a tremendous impact on both health, air quality, and climate. And finally, we in the Climate and Clean Air Coalition, um, which is a partnership of hundreds of, of uh, partners, including 70 plus countries, and the rest are NGOs, um, multilateral organization, banks, and, and uh, local governments. So we in the CCAC, we uh, work on um, with many stakeholders um, and countries to help prioritize actions for clean cooking, heating, and lighting as part of our portfolio. And we support countries with technical expertise to develop clean household energy programs through national climate action plans and disease uh, and related household and energy policies. So in this critical moment, uh, we are happy to join efforts with every woman, every child to prioritize international action to reduce household air pollution as both a climate and a health priority. And we in the Secretariat, the CCAC Secretariat, we are also very happy to, to participate in the WHO's World Health Organization's new health and energy platform, HEPA, to help drive progress toward, to achieve um, the SDG 7 and the SDG 3. And Sandra Cavalieri, she is our focal point for this work, and she will also be in this webinar towards the end and help summarize what, what the outcomes are, takeaway messages. So I look forward to the discussion and get the latest information on health impacts from WHO and hear experience from on the ground activities in India and Nepal to advance uh, clean energy to improve health and slow the rate of climate change. Finally, big thanks to you, Tara Ramanathan from NextLeaf for moderating this session. We have collaborated now quite a few years, and I know that you will provide a very sharp lens on the importance of engaging women and households in the development solutions. Maybe before passing it over to you, Tara, uh, um, we can just go through the ground rules for using WebEx. Can you pass on to next slide, Sandra, please? 
So for you, if you're not used to WebEx, you uh, will find the options of how to adjusting your voice and, and, and uh, hearing abilities. Go to next one, you can do the test button or you can also use the, the chat button to ask questions about technical issues you might find. What we want to recommend all of you is to use the Q&A uh, bar, which you find, as you see in this slide, in, where there are three dots, three point dots, and it says Q&A. So when you have questions to your um, speak to any of the speakers, please write it there. If you have any other, you can go to next slide. No, next slide. If you have other other things you want to like either share with participants or or just ask about technicalities, use you can use the chat box. And there is a polling I can see up now, uh, just to make sure that we know who you are and what type of organization you work for. So with this being said, thanks again for everybody who is attending and to all the speakers that will be enlightening us. And over to you, Tara. Great, thank you so much, Helena. So I am Tara Ramanathan, uh, Director of Clean Energy at NextLeaf Analytics. Uh, hello, everyone. After six years of working in clean cooking, I have learned how important it is to ensure diverse perspectives from policymakers and country leaders have a platform to share radically honest lessons learned, insights, and needs. And so it is for this reason that I am truly honored to be moderating such a diverse panel. Thank you to the CCAC for hosting this event and bringing these accomplished leaders into this discussion. So each speaker will have up to 10 minutes to present, and then I will guide us in a discussion at the end. Our first speaker is Heather Adair Rohani. She is team leader on energy and health at the World Health Organization. Heather, thank you for being here. I invite you to unmute and turn on your video and start us off. Thank you so much, Tara. I'm not sure if everyone can hear me now. Are you, is it okay? Yes. Perfect, okay. And I will wait um, until my slides come up. And as and thank you for the introduction. Indeed, my name is Heather Adarohani. I'm a technical officer here at WHO, but I've been leading the work on energy and health for almost a decade now. So um, we are we're expanding our breadth to to include energy access in healthcare facilities as well. So we're really trying to tackle child health from the root causes of disease and making sure that they have the the the, the access to care that they need through energy access. Um, so, we'll begin here. Um, next slide, please. Oh, can I control? Okay, there we go. Okay, thank you. So, each year about, we're going to start from a very large angle, and about 1.7 million child deaths just in children under five are attributable to the environment. Now, of this, the largest are to air pollution, in particular household air pollution due to rest childhood pneumonia um, in children under five. However, this doesn't necessarily account for all the other deaths of those children greater than five um, due to exposure to household air pollution, other risk factors in the environment. Next slide, please. So what is it? How is it that the environment impacts child health? And why is it we are concerned in terms of working on energy and air pollution about child health in particular? And it's specifically because of the window for a you know, window of exposure and this developmental stage that's so critical and where we can really intervene to help for a long-term healthy life for these children. And, and during the prenatal and early childhood period, essentially children are and um, children in the womb are very exposed and highly vulnerable to particular abnormalities in development from exposure to various mutagens in the environment or a toxicity in the environment. So it's really critical that we try to protect them from very early on. Next slide, please. So there's a whole source of different causes of, of ill health within our environment. And we really need to address and tackle all of them. And we all have a particular role to play. But starting from the womb, we can have an impact by reducing household air pollution and ensuring that this, the health and well-being of these children is, is, is properly developed and they have the opportunity to, draw, to grow up to be a healthy human and contribute to the society and, and have a full life. Um, for example, a study in an initial study taken done in Guatemala, where they actually looked at children that were in the womb exposed to household air pollution, actually showed lower cognitive abilities. So starting very early, 
we actually saw the impact of what a household air pollution can do and how we need to be taking steps at the beginning, well in the beginning of life to, to, to protect health moving forward. Next slide, please. So as the SDGs are moving forward, it is an excellent opportunity to really take action in a variety of different areas to improve child health. And WHO sees, for example, household energy and energy in general as a very energy access is a key issue where we can really tackle and address many, many of the issues related to sustainable development and really improve and protect the child and protect their future moving forward. Next slide, please. So let's get into the details. So air pollution in itself is a major source of ill health as uh, introduced by um, Helena. It accounts for about 93% of, well, 93% of children are under five are exposed to air pollution way above levels of, uh, of W2 air quality guidelines. Now when we say exposed to air pollution, this includes both ambient and household air pollution. I'm presenting both of those figures because it's important to recognize that household air pollution is a major source of outdoor air pollution in many, many areas of the world. So by addressing household air pollution, we're actually re reducing risk, not only of those household, those children living in the household itself, but also the exposure to air pollution for the entire population across the world. Household air pollution of itself within this particular 630 million deaths accounts for about 400 million deaths, specifically can be attributed to household air pollution. Next slide, please. So the specific diseases that are related to household air pollution and which we try as and, and addressing household air pollution early on as a means of prevention of these diseases are specifically heart disease, uh, stroke, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, childhood pneumonia, lung cancer, and cataract. Those are the specific outcomes where we actually calculate disease burden because we have very strong um, estimates, epidemiological evidence supporting that where we can derive risk estimates. But there's other, a lot of emerging evidence supporting adverse pregnancy outcomes, cognitive development, tuberculosis, and diabetes, all being uh, affected by exposure to out, uh, air pollution and beginning in the womb. Now, many of these diseases are non-communicable diseases, and this is a growing issue across the world. As people are getting longer and we're improving our health care, we see many, many more and more non-communicable diseases enter the disease the background disease rates. And this is going to be more and more the case. So we need to really start early in prevention. And so we can prevent heart disease, we can prevent stroke, we can prevent COPD among these populations living in, in poor households who are not smoking, who are not uh, dealing with some of the other risk, many risk factors leading to these communicable diseases. So, um, but are just trying to cook over an open fire or try to get a warm meal, hot, um, warm meal, warmth on a cold night, light in the evening. So we really can start early by preventing these diseases and in, in these children early by tackling household air pollution and air pollution in general. Next slide, please. So as some specific disease outcomes related to child health that more and more epidemiological evidence is growing on relates to specifically like stunted growth, reduced lung function, increased increased risk for developing asthma or the onset of asthma attacks that happen often in high levels of air pollution. We see cognitive impacts in the development of the brain, how these chil how children are able to, to integrate and, and, and retain information and, and process information is being impacted by this air pollution that they are forced to breathe in every day. Um, it also is a, a major risk for low birth weight, premature birth, small for gestational age. It's a source of childhood cancers. And it's also, as mentioned before, increases these risks for these more adult chronic diseases that we see later in life. Because starting early, being exposed to these over and over and over again lead to these diseases. Um, next slide, please. And there's other insects and health impacts associated with the inefficient use of energy in the home. And that's beyond disease outcomes specifically. Burns. Um, the use of kerosene for cooking, for example, is expected is, is ex, um, estimated to be the largest source of childhood poisonings in, in low and middle income countries. Um, the, the knocking over of inefficient cook stoves and things is a major source of burns and injury in the household. And we also have issues related to musculoskeletal development and what have you in children who are, who are often carrying very heavy loads of, of fuel wood um, throughout the day. Next slide, 
And then we go even further, if we take pub the public health angle to where it requires everything from our education to our social health and well-being, that we look for the social impacts of household air pollution, and we can see in those areas where we have some data, some children are spending up to um, eight hours, 12 hours in, in, a, week, in a day or a week um, to, uh, to collect fuel wood. This time could be spent for them to go to school, for, for maybe learning a particular trade, or for them actually just being a kid and playing, as we know how important play is for the development of children. Next slide, please. So we all have a part to play in protecting um, children from dirty air, and, um, and, and we all have a key role from different angles that we can play. So we're talking both at different sector levels, whether that's the energy sector, the health sector, the environment sector, or if it's you as an individual in the community. Um, that we need to be engaging to make sure that we address household air pollution. Next slide, please. So what is it specifically the health sector can do and why is WHO in this business? Some of the specific things I've already presented to you, for example, the evidence on the health impacts of, of particular um, inefficient technologies for energy or those that are efficient, such as clean cooking. Um, we actually can go through and synthesize the evidence, the epidemiological evidence, to provide some normative standards and, some, and synthesize this evidence to give to policymakers in different areas and technical staff working in different sectors, such as energy, what have you, to, um, to use this information to affect a programmatic planning and implement solutions that are protective for health in their transition to, um, to cleaner energy. Um, in addition, we have the opportunity of the ability to monitor and engage with different ministries um, as health is a common denominator and a good argument to present to other actors working in different sectors to come together to work to solve a common problem like clean cooking and clean household energy. Next slide, please. One of those things that I mentioned earlier in the next slide is this idea of normative guidance. In November 2014, WHO published the first ever normative guidance for household fuel combustion. The WHO guidelines for indoor air quality household fuel combustion has specific recommendations, evidence-based recommendations, to really train and guide um, sector health and other actors working in other sectors to implement clean solutions that will provide health benefits. And with these recommendations for everything from practical recommendations on what the fuels and technology, the specific performance levels that needs to come from those particular fuels and technology to specific fuels they shouldn't use, but also for the policy level of trying to like, when you're planning, planning the transition to clean energy, how can you maybe prioritize health and ensure you have the most health impacts um, gained through, through that transition? So really, ex, you know, prioritizing some transitional solutions uh, as, you know, it's switching to clean energy is not going to happen overnight. And there's also synergies with other issues such as climate change mitigation and opportunities could be there for, for people to harness to address clean energy in the home. Next slide, please. Next slide. This was a, uh, I didn't have time. Next slide, please. And this is my last slide. Uh, well, no, one more slide after this. Um, so the health and energy platform of action. This is, a, uh, as mentioned earlier by Helena, this is a, a new mode that we are trying to really leverage the, the, the health argument to pull the health and energy actors working together to really accelerate the um, clean cooking to protect health and to achieve SDG 7 and, and, and SDG 3. Um, this is a particular interagency platform that's being led, uh, is being convened by WHO, UNDESA, UNDP, and World Bank. It's really bringing health and energy actors together where we can provide information the technical level and the policy and programmatic level, as well as our community and advocacy to outreach in, in, in a harmonized way. I'm going to stop there as I know I've gone over time. And thank you. Thank you so much, Heather, for your passionate and informative presentation. Uh, the evidence you share on the connection between air pollution and children's health makes it very clear how urgent it is to accelerate long-term uptake of household energy solutions, including cooking, lighting, and heating. So our next speaker is Smitha Rakesh, who is the Portfolio Director of Clean Energy and Climate Action at Social Alpha. Smitha, thank you so much for being here. You can begin. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, greetings to all the members of the audiences who've joined us today. 
and thank you very much for the organizers of the platform. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a real honor and privilege to be uh, speaking at a platform like this. I think I must put out a disclaimer before I start. Um, you know, I, uh, I've, been, I've been a part of this sector like many of you, all of you, in fact, I believe, uh, for many, many years, and we've been invested into the sector uh, far too long. And therefore, I'm going to be, you know, the hat that I wear and the lens that I wear very often these days is, is uh, that of introspection. And if that comes across as provocative or complaining at times, please bear with me. Uh, the intention is only to have a more objective sort of a critique of the work we've done collectively. And, you know, I definitely include, include the work that I have done as a part of uh, the sector so far. Um, so I think, uh, you know, let's start with the acknowledgement first, right? Um, you know, as, as a collective, all the practitioners, all actors, we've done a lot. And, you know, and things that we've made sure have happened, things that we've made sure have, um, you know, changed are essentially, uh, you know, made sure that this, the collective advocacy sort of continues to make this conversation a relevant one. You know, we've made, we've, we've made sure that uh, the, the relevance of the topic and, and the platforms like these sort of keep supporting it. Um, um, you know, in, in terms of highlighting the need that it has. But having said that, uh, if we look at it crit critically and objectively, are we where we set out to be at this point in time? And I'm sure many of you will agree with me that we're not there yet. Um, more importantly, you know, we need to at this point pause and realize uh, one, if we if we're losing momentum, if we need gear shifts, but also because, you know, clean cooking is a very intrusive space. You know, we've gotten into people's homes, we've gotten into their kitchens and, you know, we've done it with all the right intentions and the, the sort of passion to make a difference to their lives. But at the end of the day, let's be very objective in understanding if all the information, all the data, all the insights that we've taken as learnings, have we managed to give back in, in you know, in a proportion, in the right proportion and a fair proportion to that, to the communities. And I think that's one question that's been bothering me for uh, some time because I feel like we've, we've collectively worked on it for the for a very, very long time and we haven't managed to move the needle as much as we would have liked to. Okay, um, so, you know, getting started with, uh, you know, with, with sort of where I come from. And I think uh, for me, uh, like, um, you know, Heather said, uh, it started off for me as an energy access, clean cooking started off as an energy access and climate action agenda. But it was very soon that I realized that it also was as much of a health and gender agenda. And I think the essence of solving this problem lies in understanding and that these are not conflicting agendas. In fact, the best way to look at them is to look at them as concentric circles, you know, one within another, with health and gender definitely being at the core of it. Um, you know, I, I think the statistics that uh, Heather put out are very, very, um, you know, shocking. And uh, and they basically, they highlight why health and gender continue to be at the center of this. But also realizing that, you know, things uh, that have impacted human health in the in the shorter timeline are the ones that have manifested into impacting the health of the planet uh, in the longer scheme of things. And therefore, these are all, you know, connected and we're not talking about one stakeholder's objectives versus the other. So for the, you know, because I do not have a presentation and I, I thought I'd share a more like an honest rant uh, with you all today. Uh, also from, you know, talk about some of the work that we are all doing and what's needed to change uh, the gears, like I said. Uh, what I've done is I've structured my presentation into four buckets. So the next few minutes I'll spend into, uh, you know, divide it into four buckets. And just for easy di digestibility of my, um, you know, content without, uh, you know, PowerPoint slides, I thought I'd borrow from the management or marketing jargons, the four P's, but I'd tweak that around to the clean cooking space. Uh, so I'll talk about tech and solutions. So the product, the first P. I'll talk about policy, which is the second P. I'll talk about how do we get that solution to the market. So the models of delivery, which uh, you know I'm terming as process, and then finally the social aspects, the cultural aspects, and the cognitive behavior side of it, which is the people, the fourth P. And honestly, you know anyone who's worked as a practitioner or as or as any stakeholder in the clean cooking space, we realize that these are the four key moving paths uh, that we've got to sort of fix uh, in, in ensuring any of our initiatives have the right impact on the ground. So maybe, and I think finance is something uh, that I'll talk about as you know in each of these. So I've not sort of included that as a as a fifth bucket. Um, so starting with the tech and the product piece, which is you know which is at the core of of some of the dilemmas uh, in clean cooking that we've had for all these years. Um, you know I cannot begin to emphasize enough the need for innovation, and you know and when I say innovation, I mean cook stoves and beyond. You know not just limiting ourselves to one kind of solution. 
one of the key things that the champions of clean cooking so far uh, in india and globally have done is that we've managed to break the um, you know the this the silo of of stick solutions and make this about a clean cooking problem and not just a clean cook stoves issue and i think what is important here is to realize that when we treat one technology segment and keep focus, shifting our focus from one segment to another from cook stoves to biogas to solar what we are doing is we are disincentivizing innovation in in the other categories and therefore there is a need for very distributed attention as well as funding for innovation in each of these areas you know we've had products um, in in each of these segments which have ticked various boxes of you know you know uh, of emissions of efficiency of safety parameters of meeting the user's requirement um, you know they've ticked boxes for various stakeholders but very few products have actually managed to tick the boxes of all of these you know affordability all of these criteria um, you know across and that's where the real challenge lies in scaling up and ensuring the adoption of these solutions and therefore uh, you know the what what we've been trying to do at social alpha is that innovation and entrepreneurship is at the core of our work and we try and focus on uh, you know not just working on pushing the product into a competitive space so not just looking at entrepreneurs in the clean, clean cooking space who are coming up with solutions for clean cooking but also in the enabling ecosystem because we you know we've got to drive everyone we've got to drive the manufacturer we've got to drive you know every enabler of the of the of this market segment to ensure that there's a you know there's a push for the right innovations to reach the market so so i you know i wanted to highlight that coexistence of solutions and having more and more options um, you know for the market is what is needed instead of backing one solution after the other and that's something that we've done so far you know we've had these waves of um, you know shifting our attention from one solution to the other also as stakeholders synergy in our parameters uh, you know when we when we look at uh, selecting the right products to um, to promote in the in the market how do we make sure that we are factoring in the climate angle we are factoring in the health angles from the very beginning and we are not just looking at you know very slight incremental changes on one parameter or the other so that kind of an integrated approach and ensuring that the users perspectives are central to any innovation that we are supporting because at the end of the day you know the user is the customer you know we are, we are we are in we are not just enabling uh, you know um, a distribution of stoves we want to be enabling clean cooking solutions that are reliable that are consistently used and are adopted by a large segment of the community and what is missing and you know i speak more from india perspectives but i'm sure um, you know my uh, you know colleagues from other countries um, you know some of this might resonate with the situation in the, those countries as well there's a massive gap in test facilities you know in 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 r and d facilities even if we have set up um, you know a, a sizable infrastructure and there is um, you know there are uh, agencies uh, funding and supporting r and d there is still a huge huge gap and i think um, you know test facilities also you know labeling and certification and and you know agencies that are uh, ensuring that right quality products are uh, certified and moving into the market um, there's there's a huge a uh, gap and in terms and that acts as a huge bottleneck in ensuring that we have uh, more options there for the customers to choose from and uh, you know and finally you know looking at it in a more holistic approach like i said so our technology selection is not going to be you know a point in time selection we can't say this is better today or day or you know at at this point in time uh, so what we do have done and that's the approach that we've taken in running an international you know uh, you know incubator uh, supporting innovation that essentially um, you know is is growing is evolving and you know it needs a lot of inputs and therefore not just r and d centers but test beds where innovators can plug in their solutions and you know um, you know get insights really fast and they don't have to create an entire social um, you know setup and a program setup to get um, you know nimble insights from the ground in terms of user feedback so i think all of that is something that is needed from the product and innovation point of view i'll probably talk about the third p uh, because it's related to this which is the the models of delivery and uh i think uh, you know what is important here i can see i'm running out of time uh, what is important here is uh, a push from the grant to market driven and i've spoken about entrepreneurship and therefore even uh, you know higher amount of risk capital uh, to be supporting and backing the entrepreneurs that are there but also churning out um, you know more entrepreneurs uh, that are backing some of these solutions and not just in product but also in you know delivery models and supply chain
Um, I think, uh, you know, policy, we are all um, sort of aware of the various uh, push in, in, in the biomass cookstove sector, the biogas sector, as well as the new LPG uh, flagship program of the government of India. Uh, but there's definitely been a skewed, uh, you know, urban and rural focus in terms of uh, infrastructure for clean cooking. And that's something I wanted to highlight in the little time that I have. Um, but what it ends up doing is that, uh, you know, it ends up creating silos and sometimes as a message reflects as competing agendas of the different technology segments that often uh, you know compete for subsidy that often compete for the right push uh, from the policy instruments and agencies instead of uh, creating the right uh, you know sort of a, a, an embedded and integrated uh, message for the market and finally and maybe i'll talk about this later uh, but um, you know one one core area is, is the people's part. And, and I do want to leave you with a thought around behavior change communication here. Uh, how are we doing it? Are we doing it particularly top down? Are we doing it in a very patronizing way? Aren't we, you know, are we really engaging or are we being, aren't we being a little too preachy? And it's not just about clean cooking, but, you know, I'd probably say this about development sector, um, you know, behavior change communication on the whole. Have we looked at, um, you know, Especially when we, in the absence of the most, um, you know, um, you know, solutions that we are 100% sure about, have we? It also begets an ethical question. Are we, are we very, very confident of why we are looking for a particular behavior change when we are not very sure of the kind of solutions we want the communities to adopt? Uh, so that that's an entire area that needs to, uh, that we need to pause and relook at. And I'll, I'll stop there and maybe cover some of the other points uh, in in some of the upcoming segments, Tara. Thank you, and sorry for overshooting the time a little bit. Thank you so much, Smitha, for the honest reflection and speaking to core components of effective and impactful clean cooking solutions. Uh, you spoke to how can we build an enabling ecosystem that prioritizes listening to end users and aligning innovations and delivery around that. So um, definitely looking forward to more discussion later. Uh, our final speaker is Mr. Madhusudan Adhikari, who is the Executive Director at the Alternative Energy Promotion Center in Nepal. Mr. Adhikari, thank you for being here. You can uh, now begin your presentation. <clears throat> thank you, Tara. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, good uh, afternoon from Nepal. Uh, uh, thank you for organizing this event and uh, calling me in. And um, I'm very grateful to uh, share my experience. Uh, it's perfectly fitting the sequence. Um, Heather um, already highlighted the uh, situation, the impact of the polluting cooking uh, solutions. Uh, and the statistics are very alarming that uh, we have to do something as it's highlighted. And then uh, um, uh, um, the Smita Rakesh has um, given a very good uh, conceptual model that uh, how these systems are integrated, wh where we should be focusing. And uh, now I'm going to share some of our uh, ground experience um, uh, and implementation. Then I will definitely talk a bit more on the issues, uh, which are common, we all understand. For the benefit of uh, the all audiences, um, I'm currently heading the institution called Alternative Energy Promotion Center, which is basically promoting clean energy and also focusing on the clean cooking. Uh, we started it from 1996. We consolidated effort uh, started from 2000. Uh, we have a uh, next slide, please. Um, we, um, uh, yeah, this is this, this, this structures. I'm just going to talk a little bit on the energy sector overview then clean cooking solution status, government policy and plan, and then uh, the institution where I'm uh, working is uh, APC, future plan and cooking sector. Next slide, Paige. Uh, this, is, this is the general energy situation of Nepal. We still have uh, heavily dependent on the traditional energy. That's around 68%. Uh, and the rest comes from the commercial energy, very small percentage, 3.2 comes from the renewable energy. Uh, in the SGD agendas also, uh, the uh, issue is um, uh, our uh, electricity access is getting 90%, uh, fire reduce use is still 62%, LPG use is 30, 22%, and then uh, energy efficiency is low. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> 
Uh, this is the tra trajectory we moved uh, in our cooking uh, initiative uh, promoted through my organization. We were working here from 2000. We basically moved in the sequence of the clean cooking solutions. Uh, the most of the urban people today are cooking in LPG, and the most of the rural people are cooking firewood and uh, and cow dung and all other um, um, bio residues. Uh, the the sequence is now we from three stone fireplaces we have come to the uh, first improved uh, mud stove um, and then a different series of like uh, these uh, metal stoves uh, which um, uh, we are um, promoting to the different segment uh, and all together we have uh, done around 1.5 million um, household um, uh, supported with the improved cookie stove and 3 million households are using traditional inefficient stoves still. So this is the scenario. Next slide, please. And biogas also, Nepal did, uh, in terms of its size and uh, population, we did a lot of work in biogas. We constructed uh, more than 430,000 biogas. And um, many of these biogases are uh, resistant to CDM also. Uh, this is a uh, one of the best technology in the villages when there is uh, integrated farming, um, animal rearing, uh, gas production, and manure production thing. So this is quite accepted in the villages, not destroying their um, farm product, but increasing the productivity in the integrated stage. We also had a lot of um, revenue for in terms of uh, selling the CR, that is climate related issue. We have already 3.3 million certified window emission reductions already sold, and we have received around 15.5 million US dollar in the return. So this is a quite a, a quite example that we can also get the revenues earned from all these initiatives, which also integrated to climate change mitigation measures and also increase the livelihood of the people increasing their farm productivity, and also some revenue for future uh, scaling of the program. We around 30,000 people are working in the biogas sector. This is a quite an example of a developing countries having this initiative. Next slide, please. Uh, in terms of policies, uh, we have been very generously supported by many development partners and we're from the constitution to every level. We have highlighted this issue, right to live in a healthy environment. In our constitution, biomass energy strategy, we have developed, which is clearly defined the target trajectory for clean cooking solutions in ministry. We have a very exclusive white paper saying we have to increase our electric cook stops. In our pre periodic plan, we have a very clearly defined plan for uh, cook, cook, uh, cooking solution movement. And this climate change policy also we highlight this. Uh, we have a subsidy policy to subsidize different technology, including the clean cook, cooking solutions. We have very categorically defined this is a nationally determined contribution as our initiative to reduce it. We have a fund to manage um, the the ongoing projects, providing soft loans, subsidies to the people dedicatedly working on this, and we are also having this custom tax and duty free so the import of these uh, improved solutions. Uh, this is one of the priority sector of the government. And next slide, please. Next slide, please. And, uh, and uh, one, uh, just go one before, please. One before. One slide before, yeah, thank you. Uh, this is uh, we are talking about the data we i uh, just recently did a survey of um, 22 districts so to say we have 75 district out of uh, the 75 22 districts are in the plain and uh, near to the in, uh, indian border which is uh, heavily populated 50 percent of our population lives in these 22 districts so we have surveyed uh, the cooking solution and we found that uh, the, in three different cluster we have um, Still, 76% uh, in average are cooking in uh, fuel wood, so to say. And then we have a breakdown of the solution they are adopting. In cluster one, the, the, the traditional cookie stove is 58%, cluster two, 
is 55 percent cluster three and accordingly there is very less ics and then biogas percentage everything is quite less lpg has the second biggest uh, contribution or share on that so altogether we can say that either there is lpg or traditional coke stop so to say but other things are picking up so this data was very very much useful for us who is doing what and to plan our future activities next slide please uh, then this is the our uh, next five year periodic plan of the government which is designed by national planning commission of uh, nepal and we have very specific target um, for our um, clean cooking solutions uh, in the five years time we want to increase the domestic biogas by 200000 institutional biogas uh, by 600 uh, like this and we want to move to um, the electric cooking 500000 and then a, a briquette pallet production to 100,000, 100,000 metric ton, and then clean cooking solution to uh, 1 million household in five years. So this is the government plan for next five years. Uh, next, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, this is uh, our annual program in my office. Uh, uh, in my 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 uh, um, organization is the leading organization is a nodal organization from last three years. Government has already given us 10 million USD budget to work on this clean cooking solution. So every year I'm spending around 10 million USD on the clean cooking solution, which in terms of our size of economy and our size of priority, this is a quite uh, quite some budget to implement and dedicated in the uh, cooking areas. Uh, we are basically focusing on all these issues, pallet, uh, biogas, improved cook stoves and of course uh, we are moving towards electric cooking so this one is a uh, is, is a is, is a dedicated commitment of government uh, from the government core fund then of course i'm also getting supports from a different developing partner in technical aspect and also in the financing side next slide please I'm also partnering with clean cooking alliance so it is active in nepal i've been uh, uh, generously supported in research and development and piloting some of the issues. And we are working on old bank SMAP program also did that together with bank on this clean cooking part. Next slide, please. Uh, especially um, upcoming uh, big program, uh, we are accredited to Green Climate Fund, only government entity in Nepal to get this certification. So we have already submitted one prop uh, proposal uh, equivalent to 45 million USD uh, uh, and they have already accepted our concept. Uh, uh, this is for five years. It will be working on 1 million household with 500,000 electric stoves and 500,000 other improved cook stoves. And we are also working with uh, ISMAP uh, uh, to partner with another project uh, equivalent to 37 million USD. Uh, and that uh, we are targeting 700 million household, uh, most likely it will be all electric. Uh, and of course, with uh, other small initiative with CCA. So this is giving us uh, some ideas that we are moving in a consolidated way in the project development and implementation level uh, with the Green Climate Fund, which basically uh, looks after the climate mitigation effect as a rationale to uh, fund this project. We have a ratio of 40, 40, 20, at 40 percent grant we are expecting from the GCF. Uh, 60 percent will be the government fund. Next, please. Next slide, please. So uh, I think uh, uh, my simple presentation is just saying that uh, what initiative a typical, uh, almost uh, least developed country like Nepal, which has a lot of challenges, uh, how it is moving towards uh, clean cooking solutions, solving the people's problem, as we have already highlighted. This is basically the problems of every household. And when there's a property get a vicious effect, the, the problem is more, and it is basically affecting largely uh, to women and children. So it became a gender issue, and it's a, of course, it's a very, very, very much health issue as the statistic Heather has presented. Uh, in our experience of implementation, uh, we have uh, learned a lot of lessons and then and the issues are there. So we think uh, that the policies are uh, lacking everywhere, most in the developing countries. 
kicking cook, clean cooking is not as a priority agenda. When people talk about energy, most of the time they are confused with electricity. And when there is electricity talking in, and then there is only the lighting concern is the main in the developing countries. So cooking is, 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 is nowhere mostly. It's basically non-issue to so far to the many policymakers. So there is no clear policy. Some ad hoc programs and projects are there, but still very strongly, uh, very positive uh, discriminated policies to work on this agenda is lacking. So, so is in Nepal also. So after explaining so much we have done. I'll and actually, so sorry to cut you off, but I just don't want to make, I want to make sure we have time for discussion, Mr. Adhikari. So do you mind if we move on? Fine. So okay. this is the, se the second one is uh, the gender and uh, uh, gender problem has already been, been discussed. Uh, the sustainability of any intervention is as as very difficult to maintain because, as uh, other speaker also said, it's very much behavioral issue. It's a, it's, a, it's very difficult to change. A lot of resistance to change, and then the people's priorities are very different. Uh, Sometimes the, the the cooking solution provides. Sorry, Mr. Adhikari, we're going to move on now. Thank you so much for the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Okay, thank you so much, Mr. Adhikari, for speaking to your work in Nepal, highlighting the priorities for the country, and um, and thank you to all of the speakers for the diverse perspectives. Uh, if uh, Mr. Adhikari, if you can mute yourself, thank you. And uh, actually, I will invite now all of the speakers to turn your videos on, uh, and we will begin the deep dive into the discussion. So um, I would like to start off with a, um, a provocative question. So 2020 marks a new 10 year period and represents a critical juncture and opportunity to deliver on the promise of clean cooking for millions. In fact, billions of people around the world. What do you think we need to be doing differently? How is your work and approach to clean cooking for the next 10 years going to be different from the previous 10 years? And how do the women's or cook stoves users voices play into that? Each of you will have roughly uh, 30 seconds to one minute to comment. Uh, Heather, can we start with you? Sure, and thank you, Tara. This is a great question. It has been an exciting 10 years up to now, but now it is time. We've been over the years, this past year, we've been really developing the evidence, really raising the issue that energy access is a health issue, getting people to understand that. We've integrated health as a baseline for defining what is considered energy access. We've got to reach health guidelines to be considered clean. Now it's time to actually take action, roll up our sleeves and really move the, the dial on the clean cooking. We've got the elements to put together. Now it's time to really kickstart and work together across communities, the energy community, health community, environment community, we need to really join forces and actually implement what we're doing. That women need to be at the center and, and household energy end users, particularly women and children, need to be at the center of program and policies put forward. And their user, the, their needs need to be addressed if we really want to see the sustained adoption moving forward. Stop. Thank you so much for that, Heather, uh, and prioritizing the women's voices. Uh, Smitha, how about you? Um, you know, first of all, I really hope uh, that we don't have a 10 year strategy in the sector and I hope everyone's uh, strategies evolve in response to the sector every two years and hope within the next 10 years, you know, our work or, or most part of it becomes redundant. Um, you know, that's what, you know, I'd hope in our strategy um, and, uh, you know, so essentially, you know, innovation and entrepreneurship will continue to be our focus uh, as some of the you know, immediate priorities for the next few years. Uh, like I said, we we have some right partnerships with the with the government and PSUs, and particularly you know this one partnership with BIREC, which is a long term partnership for uh, on solutions for community health. Uh, I think some of these partnerships around innovation and entrepreneurship promotion, which is tech agnostic, will continue to be the centerpiece of our work. Our work on unpacking adoption and using evidence-driven methods to, um, you know, understand and introspect and, you know, sort of measure the impact of our work will continue to be a focus. And I think personally speaking, uh, like I said, um, you know, if we come up with newer technologies uh, that can, you know, as a sector, but also, you know, as from, from the core of our work, that gives back um, data, information, learnings, insights to the communities that we are collecting the data from, um, you know, that would be, uh, you know, at the core of it. So some of the work that we're trying to do with Intel Grameen and NextLeaf, um, you know, hopefully that would show us fruits in the years to come. Thank you, Smitha, for speaking to that and reminding us that hopefully it's not a 10-year strategy, but rather we're evolving uh, every few years. 
Uh, and Mr. Adhikari, could you speak uh, very briefly about uh, this question and your thoughts? Thank you. I think, uh, the, as I showed in my presentation, uh, we are geared up. Uh, we are a small country. We we have our own problem to solve in the issue. We may not contribute that much to the global agenda, but we can definitely share our experience. Uh, we have a lot of ground uh, ground uh, truthing, ground test, and we are geared up. And I think as the country is getting slowly uh, fully electrified, at the 10 years time, we'll be basically focusing on reaching to half of the people by electric stoves because Nepal is more uh, promising in electricity generation. So that will be the path. And I think the foundation is already there. So we can share our experience with the global community. And we are also contributing the climate mitigation effect through this. Thank you. That's really excellent. And I think that the global community has a lot to learn on the promise of electricity. So thank you for that. Um, also, uh, I believe we can go over uh, by about five to 10 minutes. So um, I just wanted to make sure everyone knows that. Um, so for those who can stay, that's great. And um, I think that uh, we have a good discussion ahead of us. So one specific question for you, Heather. Uh, so the WHO has been clearly instrumental in shedding light on the urgency and health risks from not accelerating um, clean energy at scale and bringing standards to healthy exposure levels in the household. This sector is now beginning to embrace the reality that um, everybody is going to be using their clean stove and their traditional stove uh, because they have a lot of cooking needs and a lot of data is showing that fuel stacking is a reality and uh, demonstrating that women need a variety of clean cooking options in their households in order to meet their needs. What do you think about this idea of a clean stack? Do you think it's even possible to achieve this? And if so, what do you think are the enabling factors required? Thanks so much. This is a great question. And um, first of all, it's totally possible. I know I, I'm living in a country and I wake up every morning and I boil my tea on my stove and my electric tea kettle. I cook in my oven and I do all these things. I know it's possible. They're all clean cooking solutions and we need to make that possible for the rest of the world. And I think one way of doing that is making sure that the users in the center of how we monitor uh, the household energy use, who's using what, and that's particularly the woman, and why they're using one stove versus another, or one energy use, one, why they're using electric stoves only, for example, heating water for tea, or why are they using only LPG to prepare, to prepare rice or something along those lines. We need to find out what is it, why is there these particular solutions being used, how can we make sure that they continue to be used? And what is it that we can do to disincentivize them to use these more polluting technologies? In many cases, that's the affordability, the availability, and just the usability of these devices. So I think that's that, that's critical. I also want to advocate for the, it's not just cooking alone. You know, the woman may be cooking on an electric stove and an LPG stove most of the time, if not all the time, but if she's open, staying warm at night with an open fire in the corner, We've also mitigated or negated much of any benefit from the house. So we need to make sure we're addressing all the household energy end uses to ensure that we have health benefits for the women and children living there each and every day. I'll stop there. Thanks, Sarah. That is very interesting and really always good to ground ourselves in reality of the fact that we all stack too. And so how could we possibly expect um, women in villages not to stack? So thank you for that. Um, Actually, Smitha, I would be curious to hear your response to what Heather shared, um, if if you're comfortable with that, just because given your experience on the ground, in the field, with women um, seeing fuel stacking um, firsthand, um, do you have any responses to what Heather shared or any comments on this? I couldn't agree more. Uh, you know, we, we've got to understand that there's going to be, um, you know, multiple solutions and they all have to be clean. They all have to be, you know, friendly to the users and they all have to be accessible. And there has to be choice uh, in the market, choice while cooking. Uh, you know, it, it can't be, uh, you know, one solution. Also, I think the a very interesting point that uh, and very relevant point that Heather made uh, was around the multiple uh, energy usage in our household, um, you know, space heat. 
any other kinds of you know whether it's cattle feed preparation we've seen that happen that there are two different stoves for different kinds of um, you know size of cooking and i think we've got to factor all of that those um, you know in and i think you know so re a reliable solution would need two three things it would definitely need uh, to meet all the requirements uh, be accessible and affordable but in the longer run for a you know for a longer time period not just um, you know uh, as as a one time solution stop gap solution at the same time it will have to earn the trust on the basis of performance, and it will have to have that element of predictability in its in its supply and its access and its performance. Yeah. Thank you, Smitha. Um, very interesting, and I'm sure I, I bet you and Heather could probably talk for a while on this topic since you've both spoken to this. Um, and actually, Mr. Adhikari, I would be curious about your comment as well because on your last slide you mentioned uh, the idea of behavior change uh, and. And you know how that has been really important in Nepal. And I would be interested to kind of hear a debate between you um, and Smitha actually on this topic, because Smitha earlier talked about um, behavior change um, becoming kind of condescending, kind of, you know, trying to um, tell women what to do in their households. And I've been very curious, what is the balancing tension between listening to women um, and communicating to them about their health? Uh, without being uh, forceful and trying to force a solution on them that they don't actually want. Uh, so, Mr. Adhikari, I'd be curious what you think about that. Oh, to, um, Mr. Adhikari, can you please unmute? Right. I'm sorry, I, I, I fully agree with the two speakers. Uh, it is a complex, it looks simple, but it is a complex because of the at the awareness level of the people directly involved, uh, I would say the cooking cooking uh, person, basically the women in the developing country. Uh, then, of course, their priorities, uh, their their the total housework chores, they have to do it because they are time constrained. They have to finish everything, and then of course the complexity of heating and cooking, and complexity of uh, cooking for the people and cooking for the animals, and of course uh, the the other issue like. Uh, uh, people have the also a myth that uh, they need some smoke to uh, to remove some of the termites and some of the uh, snakes and the other any other unwanted uh, creature inside the house. Uh, and then of course uh, the thing you do is always you are comfortable even not knowingly how harmful it is. So it is it is a it is a big challenge. But I think with the now audio visual uh, information you bring the movies you you demonstrate. To them, you you have uh, the statistics from the hospitals. Uh, that that's uh, that's uh, completely a different uh, issue. Uh, it is it, it, even I have also a special um, a feature in this that uh, you 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 talk about the beauty of the people because the people in the remote villages who cooks in the uh, firewood are uh, getting aged. Their skins are getting ruined. Their eyes are not that. Uh, this thing so uh, all these factors are effective to to communicate and change their behavior but i think the awareness and then the urgency to do the things in time is most important that they need to convince and of course then comes the financing to finance it the fuel cost and equipment cost everything is talked so i fully agree that this is a complex issue not look simple but complex and it related to the change of a lot of things thank you Thank you, Mr. Adhikari, for speaking to the complexity um, and, and other needs that people have with smoke. But uh, I believe, if I understand correctly, sometimes the smoke can help to remove uh, termites and snakes. So the, there's benefits of the smoke, even though it's hurting people's health. Um, Smith, I'd be curious to hear you um, respond and even elaborate to what you were sharing earlier on behavior change communication and just how we can shift to more of a listening lens and, um, yeah. Thank you for bringing me in, in this, uh, Tara. Um, you know, I, I mean, I partially agree. And so what I'd say is I'll, I'll rephrase it. I think somebody needs to mute themselves. Um, so, um, you know, I, um, I think, uh, you know, when we say awareness creation, we need to understand what do we need to make people aware of, right? Uh, their well-being? No. You know, uh, what makes sense for them? No. 
we need to you know there is a need for sharing information you know there's a need for sharing all the insights from the research that we do on health that we do on um, you know um, on aspects of, of economy on newer solutions that are available where they can find them but we don't need to really decide for the communities right so and i've been a part of it let me clarify this i don't mean it as a you know as, as sort of a, a distant critique of the of the bcc work in the sector we've all done this we've all done it with the best intention and i'm only looking back and reflecting how could we do it differently because the fact of the matter remains any rounds of messaging do they really bring about a behavior change? You know, uh, do we are we really able to impact the cognitive behavior in a way that uh, years of traditional practice and cultural practice gets changed overnight or over a period of a few months? No. So what is needed? Um, you know, what is needed is is ways of communicating this information to them. They'll make their own judgment. You know, uh, the example that I gave about working with um, you know Intel Grameen on on um, you know this these sensors where uh, they it's actually uh, giving messages to the users about um, you know their exposure levels and when it beeps and tells them that you're exposed you know it's it's for them to make that judgment so i think we need to part the final judgment uh, you know part uh, and and trust the uh, consumers enough to make that judgment call themselves what we need to do is is in terms of awareness we need to uh, you know look at uh, you know uh, sharing information and evidence and i think the second thing very quickly i'd say is uh, one thing that I really want to suggest to the larger sector is uh, de-clubbing of awareness and any kind of product push or marketing activities. It, you know, if that product fails, it often ends up damaging uh, the entire messaging around creating awareness uh, around the need for the switch. So I think I'll stop there. All right. Thanks. Thank you. So that is excellent. And I think um, it, one thing you said about, we just, we need to trust the users to make the judgment call themselves. And I think there's lots of behavior change communication where I live around cigarette smoking and, um, other things like that. And at the end of the day, the people who are doing the awareness raising still trust the people to make their judgment call. And we need to do the same thing with the women and just really humanize them more. So thank you for shedding light on that. Um, so, uh, just to, Shift a little bit, uh, Mr. Adhikari, uh, you are taking a leading role in bringing renewable energy to Nepal, which is so important for people's health and the planet. Um, you've shared how complex clean cooking is, and uh, and you've also mentioned about Nepal being 90% electrified. I'm curious, uh, and you, you mentioned also Nepal is a small country, and so um, there's so much to do for you as a leading role in Nepal. I am curious, what do you see as the role of data in evaluating the effectiveness of electric cooking programs around Nepal, specifically looking at you know, the extent to which people are actually using the solutions you're distributing? And how can we as a sector balance the priorities of data collection with the priorities of listening to women uh, and their preferences? Uh, thank you. Very important question. So, yeah, it's, uh, and basically, I think uh, ultimately we all uh, definitely going to cook mostly in one one or another form of electricity uh, and renewable or non renewable because this is this is the most efficient and most um, you know, most uh, least polluting uh, way of cooking. So hopefully, and uh, in in terms of in terms of uh, the solutions. Uh, there are so many factors affecting it. I think uh, the reliability of the services is one thing. The electricity is still not very reliable in many countries, and the cooking is very time-bound activities. You have to send your children to school. You have to finish by 9 o'clock in the morning. Then, of course, in the evening you cook, then you need electricity. So this is supply is an important thing. And the second thing is uh, the, the food cooking patterns. Uh, most of the developing countries, they cook uh, the, the, the basic raw uh, raw uh, grains or rare raw food uh, stuff, and it take long time. It did not a lot of heat to cook. Uh, so that's also uh, one parameter. But slowly, as the people are getting aware of the time factors and then energy factors, uh, their cooking change patterns is also changing. And um, the most important thing is now, I think, in the developing countries, in our cases, Mostly people are having joint family in the past. Now the people become nuclear family. So there are not more than three, four members in a in a in a household. So that make it easy that the the electric cooking uh, can solve the, their problem of uh, cooking uh, because the the quantity to cook is less. Uh, and then uh, of course the, the the processing of the 
uh, food grains before cooking is also playing roles. But uh, the women, uh, some of the people uh, we met and talk, uh, like if you talk about the induction stove, when people don't see anything red burning, then they don't believe it, it can cook. So our, our, our experience says that the infrared, where you can see the red thing uh, as, a, as, as a burning place, then it motivates people. So they believe more on that than the induction, which is much better than in the infrared. So there are so many factors that uh, that works in, uh, in, this, uh, in this arena. And of course, the safety. There are some myths that electricity kills. And then, of course, the many places uh, people die because of the poor electricity safety. And that thing is also very important because people uh, think there is a probability that you will die if you are not uh, like um, this is not a good best solution. So these all things are basically related to women. And then in our contest, uh, well, the, the child, uh, women child education is improving, but still there is not much in uh, parity with the men. So uh, I think these these issues will need to be very focused. And of course, the product and the electricity para price is another issue. If the price is not affordable, then people definitely have resistance because their disposable <laughs> income cannot uh, support their cooking. So uh, I think these are the issues to solve in the electric cooking. And I'll stop here. Thank you. No, thank you so much. And, you know, as electric cooking is getting more traction now, and I think to Smitha's point earlier, uh, with one innovation coming, we need to make sure it doesn't take away attention from other innovations. And so how do we have distributed innovation, I think is really important um, in case, you know, for some reason, electricity supply is, you know, unequal or uneven. Um, so for the final, final round, and I will just call this like a rapid fire round um, for all each of you, um, there's actually an interesting discussion going on in the Q&A. So I actually want to abandon my question that I had planned and actually um, come up with a question based on this. So. Um, Somebody, uh, Pranav Malik, uh, has brought up access of information regarding the consequences of air pollution in the remote areas of a country like India is very less. People do not know these solutions, which we generally make at a higher level. How could we share this information to the ground level in a proper way so that everyone can apply these solutions too? And, um, and then Helena brought up an important point about leaders living in rural areas need to have a seat at the table when it comes to designing and implementing solutions in their communities. And so um, to that point about leaders in rural areas having a seat at the table, I would love to hear from each of you um, 30 seconds to a minute. Just how do you think just trying to provide a practical solution? How do you think we could do that? How do you think we can ensure that leaders living in rural areas have a seat at the table when these decisions are being made around design and around implementation? Uh, let's start with you, Heather. Thanks. Um, I definitely, we've definitely seen and the leaders at all different levels are critical as they're really are champions. And, and I think that it's really, as the health sector, we have an important part because often within these areas, leaders are found in the health sector. People trust their doctors or trust their nurses, et cetera. So we as the health sector need to educate and inform them and, and give them the solutions and understanding. For example, WHO we created, we're just finalizing some health sector training to help the healthcare workers, community health workers, doctors in the community should really understand what are the solutions and how they can be rolled out within their community themselves. And I think that's the champion leader that we can see as, as an important one. Another important leader perhaps would be religious leaders that we could really tap into and, and help them help them advocate for the clean household energy to protect the people. And yes, we need to be engaging with all levels. Um, over. Thanks, Heather. Very, very interesting about the different types of leaders and even religious leaders. Uh, I will pass it to uh, Mr. Adhikari. Yes, uh, yeah, I think uh, there are different kind of leaders there. Of course, everyone has a, their role. When you take the change leaders who are the technocrat, who are aware people, maybe the teachers or uh, people from NGOs, they, they definitely are much better in communicating, but we we just cannot solve the problem by communication or by the awareness creation. Then, of course, um, many places it also very effective through the the politi these uh, religious leader. But I think the most important players are the political leader anyway. So, uh, what my particular experience uh, in Nepal is when people come, there are a lot of people politicians come to me uh, talking about their their priorities, and I always um, uh, bring this agenda and say. 
hey guys, you you talk big things. You cannot do all because of your limited resources. But when it comes to the most hurting problem, that's clean cooking or uh, traditional cooking replacement with the clean cooking, it's not expensive. You can reach to many places, many people, many households with small funds. So you you can you can raise your voice. You can be in touch with people spending four to five thousand. That's forty dollars. For a household, then you you have something to give to the people. That solves a bigger problem in their house. So please focus on that. With limited resources, you can you can bring your popularity much higher, and then maybe you get elected next time because of this only one, one solution. So this kind of messages I'm spreading. I think uh, the most important people are the local elected people who has control over people and control over um, resources. So they will be most effective. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, and finally, over to you, Smitha. Yeah, agree, agree completely. Uh, you know, local uh, leaders are as uh, necessary to the dialogue and to the conversation, and there needs to be you know, a real culture of engagement and not, uh, like I said, not passing on of information from um, you know one stakeholder to another. Um, and of course, you know the. The, how an information needs to be consumed. How do you ex explain the concept of exposure? You know, it, it doesn't need to be scientific, right? Um, you know, what difference does indoor uh, pollution as well as the similar amount of you know pollution outdoors make? And I think some of these things can be very well explained with we can all be innovative in 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 trying out new ways of messaging, uh, new uh, technology, new tools, um, you know, new actors. Um, new sort of formats and and you know and and including uh, local leaders uh, it helps you understand the pulse of um, you know what your target uh, market and target consumer segment is um, you know trying to uh, is is looking for you know and 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 I think that is very important. It's important to know that it's not like things don't change. It's not like that market segment isn't involved either, right? What are their aspirations? What are their expectations? So. Thank you so much, Smitha. That's amazing. And even your point about how it doesn't need to be scientific. People are living and breathing the smoke every day, so they see it. So it is just about maybe connecting some creative messaging and bringing in the new actors, new formats. So um, that was excellent. I'm going to um, first just, uh, I know we're all not in person, but just everyone, please give a virtual applause to all of our speakers. You've all done an amazing job shedding light, bringing honesty. So. Um, Thank you to all of you. And uh, and I'm now going to pass it on. And thank you again to CCAC for organizing this. Uh, I will pass it on to um, Sandra for the closing remarks. So thank you so much, everyone. I really feel that we could, um, that this conversation could go all day. And I wish we had another session after this so that we could dive deeper into the different aspects. Of course, this is a, well, let me introduce myself. I'm Sandra Cavalieri. I'm the Household Energy Coordinator for the Climate and Clean Air Coalition and really thank Helena for the introduction and for all of you for um, your participation in this panel. It is a complex problem as Mr. Adhikari has like really um, helped share the experience from Nepal and we at the Climate and Clean Air Coalition are also looking at the complexity of integrating the benefits that you that can be achieved for the climate in addition to health and gender and air quality and the broader SDG package, especially SDG 7, SDG 3, um, SDG 11. So there's, there's, there is so much complexity and I think that's why we need to have a very strong group of advocates and we need to expand our advocates. And so that's why every woman, every child is so important. I think at this time, every woman, every child is really bringing together the health sector and the gender advocates. And here is a, a moment that we can also bring the climate advocates together to um, recognize that this is a huge global problem that is not receiving e even a fraction of the finance needed annually in order to solve it. So. The benefits for clean energy, the benefits for human health, the benefits for women are um, are just extraordinary if we're able to work together to tackle this problem. And so um, with that, I would just like to say thank you. And I hope that we can find concrete ways to uh, move forward with national governments through the NDCs, um, with every woman, every child, with the WHO, um, to train the health leaders to understand the implications and help drive it forward. So th thank you very much, um, everybody, for, for your contribution today and I, I look forward to the next discussion. So thank you.
Thank you for having us. Thank you.